fun. Hello everybody, we're lucky to have the wonderful Tony Blake back with us today and um, with his cap on, I thought I'd wear my lion ears. And um, we're going to discuss the Enneagram. So I thought I'd just do a quick quote first to get us going from In Search of the Miraculous. And for those of you that like page numbers, page 287. So this is from Aspensky. The symbol which takes the form of a circle divided into nine parts with lines connecting them together expresses the law of seven in its union with the law of three. This construction shows the inner laws of one octave and it points out a method of cognizing the essential nature of a thing examined in itself. The isolated existence of a thing or phenomenon is the closed circle of an eternally returning and uninterruptedly flowing process. The circle symbolizes this process. The separate points in the division of the circumference symbolize the steps of this process. So thank you for joining me, Tony. What would you like to say about the Enneagram? <laughs> where would you like to start? <laughs> well, the question of where to start is, is very important because it's to do with what one has as a background, a context, and I uh, want to very much emphasize that it's quite difficult taking that wonderful diagram of the Enneagram which you can find in books, and it's a very striking image, you know, and, and starting from there, uh, because this is like starting from the outside of it. And I want to get a little bit, as much as I can, uh, into what's behind it, how, is, how it's constructed. And it's constructed in a way which uses methods or techniques or uh, um, principles which I believe go back thousands of years. But this is not to say that the actual form of the Enneagram can be found thousands of years ago. I'm completely against those who go on about where it came from. I always insist that we have no documentary evidence of the Enneagram at all before Gurdjieff. That is it. Yet at the same time, the way the mode of thinking which is in the Enneagram can be pointed to and does go back a long way. So I have to try and make sense of that. That's the statement I've, I've just made it. We, I think there's something which is like the predecessor, right, or the previous um, stage of the Enneagram which we can look into which I hope to do today. So strictly speaking, Debbie, I'm not let's talk about the Enneagram, but I'm talking about like the or well, I call it the um, the noble grandmother of the Enneagram. Mm. <laughs> because yeah, you're right, there is no, or doesn't seem to be any symbols of it before Gurdjieff, though some of us do debate Athanasius Kircher's Enneagram, which isn't quite exactly, well, it is the same in where the points are, but it's three triangles rather than the, I don't know what to call that sign when you do one, four, two, or two eight, eight, five, five. Seven, eight. Yeah, you know, I, call, is that I call it. The, well, I really call it the hexadic cycle. Hexadic. Uh, hexadic because oh, it's six law, yeah, you see. Yeah. Mm. And this is technically what describes it: the hexadic circle. <clears throat> um, so yes, the description of it is the way in which you describe it is so important. Even that the, the, the thing you read out, it had these two things. One, you see what in that description was partly absolutely factual things. There is a circle and there are points on the circle. And the other is about, was it ever returning recurrence or, or something That's like that? With the circle about, going. The circle yeah. going right. I'm going to touch upon that again. <clears throat> well, to cut a, you know, get to get stuck into this, well, one more thing to say as a preface, you see, I was very concerned with, most people, when they come across the Enneagram, um, have not studied or do not know very much about the kind of things which people did hundreds and thousands of years ago. And obviously these people were highly intelligent and they had quite complex ideas, some mathematics and so on. 
And remember that part of Gurdjieff's mission was always to insist that we should take notice of the intelligence of our forebears and not assume that they were savages or ignorant and so on, as, uh, as you know. Yeah, I think they might be more intelligent than we are now, but... <laughs> absolutely. With each uh, generation or historical period has to always to work with the material it has at hand, something which it could start from and use. I'm very interested myself in the the key innovations and one which keeps recurring in my mind is this one about the invention of the alphabet. As you know, I still wonder about it that instead of the one of the rare things which was only invented once, all other forms of writing were invented several times, but the alphabet only once in one place at one time. And I think this is amazing. And out of it, you've got Hebrew, Arabic, and the Indian European languages, and it's just a, and, if you, and what was it? A simple thing. I uh, just sorry to go off on the tangent like this, but uh, that you know the thing which happened initially in writing was called the Ravus, where you got you started with pictures, but then what they took from this was the sound of what was pictured, and. Then it was used to compose words together out of the sounds of the pictures. You see, so you could see picture and sound, that's called a ravus. <clears throat> but, and what these guys did, and there's supposed to be a group of miners, and I like this especially too, you know, Debbie, because they were not some super esoteric elite or so on. They were sort of a group of miners working with the Egyptians and wanting to find a common language to do their job. And so they weren't special, extraordinary people at all, but just people wanting to do a job. And they came at this certain thing. Instead of taking the picture to designate a uh, sound, you know, like ma or something like that, you see, they just took the initial part of it. That's just simply you know, M, M, mm, mm. and they used that was the foundation of the alphabet. That simple step, you think it's obvious, but it wasn't. That was the stroke of genius. And who was the unknown man who did? But so I've gone really off on a stretch. Can here. I quickly add something to that? Yes. I used to talk a lot to a guy called Omar, who runs a place called Ram Omar. He makes Egyptian art and he does Egyptian um, clothing, but he has such a wonderful understanding of ancient Egypt. And he used to say what you've just said, Ancient Egyptians, their written down symbols weren't, for example, cat. The word for cat was actually meow, m <laughs> meow. So they did everything by sound. But yes. you think they'd draw a picture of a cat, but they didn't. They no, did no, a no, picture no, that no. represented, or the letter represented meow, for example. I can't think of the other examples, but he went through so many. So I know yes. what you're saying there. Yes, yes. it was the sound of the word you see, represented. See the, um, Interesting, the potential is you have some means which make enables you to make combinations, new combinations. That was the thing. So you start with that, it's just the sounds you can put various sounds together and make a combination of all those different words. But if you get letters, you can make even more. And uh, it was strange to see the alphabet in its various guises are the same. In, in, it's, it's, it doesn't look the same, but it has the same elements, the ABC in Hebrew. You see, for, for example, in Arabic. Aleph, Beth, Gimel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, and in the Greek, Alpha, Beta, Gamma. And this, this kind of thing. Oh, they all have the same kind of characteristic, which meant it so, made it so versatile across many languages. But we must get on one other thing. Now, the thing I want to say is about the scholarly aspect of what I'm going to talk about, just to give some context again. And this is to do with how uh, scholars who had looked at, we we'll call it old or even ancient writings, such as uh, scriptures, for example, even books of the Bible, there was a kind of puzzle or uncertainty about some of the books of the Bible, such as I think Numbers and so on, appear to be 
unorganized and incoherent. And so they just seemed like, well, what's this rambling off and doing? It didn't make any sense of it. And this is known for hundreds of years. And even in, um, you find it in other traditions, in Persian, in some of the uh, more Islamic countries, the same kind of dismissal. This is incoherent. And it appeared that what had happened, this is the conclusion, was that the way in which these things were written had got, got lost sight of, so they didn't have the key anymore. And this is a property of our research into the past that you find sometimes things get lost. It isn't there all the time and built upon. Things get forgotten. And maybe because people are no longer interested in doing it or economic pressures or wars or whatever it is, but still that, things were forgotten. And so then they found this method, which at that time got called um, ring composition, and suddenly it all made sense. You could see the sense of it. So as the idea, you had to get an idea of the structure of it before you could make sense of it. And it showed how it was put together. Um, now, I have to try and bring two strands together in this. First of okay. all, that is that the point I just said, you've got to find, think about the structure of something and make this different from not or really kind of almost something independent to the content of something. It's, so you get these kind of structures which are enabling you to put something together, to construct something. And one of the basic things people always wanted to do, of course, was to construct a narrative. And but there are certain requirements of a narrative or a good story, you see, which we'll come, come to in a moment. So there's that whole thing about finding a structure which decoded this to see this, this which appears to be chaotic and senseless, in fact, was intelligent and meaningful. So it's an important discovery people made, and suddenly things are saying, oh, that's, that's, that's what they were doing. That's, it makes sense now. And it can, this was tested over many things. The range, which I know about, extends from, say, Homer through the uh, books of the Bible, and then even the Quran, and such modern Sufis as Rumi. So there's a, quite a wide Ban. And all of these demonstrate this method. So it seems strangely like a transcultural method, which was embedded in people who were the writers. For us, I have to say something about the narrative because it became, this method became strong with writing, mainly because with writing you could have an extended amount of material. Something spoken, it's hard to remember everything. You see, we have to do it. Okay. Well, I am being a bit slow about this. I want to get this, this atmosphere, what people were doing. And so there is a history of people telling stories in such a way that there's a message in the story of some kind. Now, there's always a some kind because when I'm going to talk about these structures, they're not kind of fixed and rigid and dogmatic. They just enable people to do things. And if you're in the tradition, you can pick up what they're doing. It doesn't always the same kind, exactly the same kind of scene. And one point I hope I don't forget is to suggest how it might tie in with, and as I interest you, as astrological structure well, and the twelvefold division, why, why that appears. Okay. Now the other thing is, there's a way of the basic key to the, the, the little gizmo, the atom of this method of composition is given a fancy name, chiasmus. Chiasmus means like a cross. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's something found in a uh, very elementary form, almost in folklore, folk speaking. I'll see if I can find uh, the an example Mary Douglas gives, if I can't find it easily, I won't um, go on with it. And chiasmus, yes. that's spelled K-E-Y, chiasmus. C-H-I-A-M-U-S, -C chiasmus, chiasmus. Oh, okay, it's not the word I thought it was, okay. Yes, hmm. all right. 
Uh, this may seem quite primitive, but it's what uh, one Mary Douglas speaks about from her childhood, about a local countryman and the way he spoke. This is actually his spoke, which um, then was quite strange, but even now it would appear quite strange. And this is the sort of thing he'd say. Uh, so if you can work out the pattern of it. These young plants don't want too much water. She had the one idea. Don't water them every day. Second statement, you see. Then something comes in different again. Water them every other day. See? There's actually three quite different statements, you see. But now it goes on. If you water them on Monday, do not on Tuesday. Water them on Wednesday. Now, what does that remind you of? You see, the second statement, don't water them every day. So it's repeated in a different form here. Now, the last one is, too much water isn't good for these young plants, which is almost the same as these young plants don't want too much water. Now, can you picture it? This, this five-fold scheme, this uh, pentad even, you see, you get a sequence which is called A, B, that's the first two lines, you see, then C, this middle line, then it's a same something similar to B and something similar to A. So the A and B have got inverted. Is that all right? Yes, <laughs> yes, I get it. Yes, yeah, it's see? great. And so the, the thing in the middle is always like the punchline. <laughs> in this example, it, you know, it's not elaborate, it's so simple, it seems a lot of repetition, but it's just like, say, because you actually, what um, the C is, is the the practical point of the whole thing. You know? Water them every other day, the definite statement. But the, the thing that surrounds them is to package the statement so you get hold of it. But what? So if you don't get it the first time, you should get it on the rebound. <laughs> <laughs> rebound, yes. And so this simple thing has a lot of structure in it. And it is to repeat myself, it has an intention of focusing on a thing in the middle. And one of the slogans about this method, which Mary Douglas and her little scholars always come out with, say, the meaning is in the middle. Now, this the is... Path. Quite... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Pardon? Go on. The middle path. <laughs> uh, well, the middle path but it is... This is sort of unusual in the sense that I would say, I don't know if you agree with me, that in most things we're more used to is like uh, building up to a climax, you see, or building up a, or sort of a declaration at the end. If we're into that kind of dramatic cycle, da -da 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 bang, you know, then there you get it, the, the thing at the end. But this, this was different, it was in the middle. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a different spirit in it, and this, I'll give a few technical things here. This is sometimes described as the thing I'm going to talk about ring composition is called Semitic rhetoric. So rhetoric, mm -hmm. more this rhetoric, as opposed to Greek rhetoric. And that appears, would appear to us as more rational in the way we're, we're used to. Now you see, forgive me, I am kind of not quite getting down to the nitty gritty yet because I wanted to get the feeling of why they were doing this and uh, what power it had and how it could be a known tradition simply by having all these various cultures already had examples of it being done and people learn from the examples. And I will cite here something to illustrate something, a point I've made about it being forgotten or I don't know, people fail to understand it anymore because uh, of the work done by this late friend of mine, Simon Waitman, who was a pupil of Bennett, <clears throat> and he worked at the School of Oriental and African Studies. And he made, with one of his students, a special study of Rumi's book, you know, the Masnawi. Oh, you know, yeah. the Masnawi. Mm -hmm. uh, you, now, fortunately, with Rumi, you get people like, I've forgotten his name, Owen Box, was it? 
you get his lovely translations of Rumi's that have become very popular. Um, but what something like Owen Marx has done is just completely destroyed the actual structure of the Mahnava. He just takes parts of it and produces this beautiful thing. Which it loses what was into it. And people take this. You know the story of Rumi? He was full of, you know, the time he was full of this inspiration from Shemzi Tabriz, his master. So you get this outpouring. He came with this creative, marvelous creative poetry. And so the whole storyline was, or the party line was, this just demonstrates a man intoxicated with love pouring out his heart, you see. But what Simon did was because he knew about this background research, was investigated and found, of course, Rumi was an in extremely intelligent man, absolutely top education of his period. And he actually knew these methods. And he used this ring composition as a form in a very conscious and intentional way. So this is important to think about this tradition. This is where people did things intentionally. And it wasn't just as a way to make things prettier or something because it enabled them to send messages. And I'll give one other example about under the character you will certainly know and like from history, that's Zorasta. Of course. Those to be known about 15 hymns which are credited to him, the gassers, as they're called, you know. Now, each of them has this kind of inner structure to them, which I'm going to explain to you in kind of thing. But not only that, the way they were constructed meant that inside them there was articulated the new thinking, the new theology which Zoroaster brought. And you had to be a cognizicati, somebody who is in a know about this way of writing to see what this message was. It was not this one, encoded, it was there within the structure of the poems themselves. So that's the promise. Now let's look at this. Let me start with the exposition. Exposition. There's also an expedition, if you imagine it. <laughs> We're going on an expedition through words. <laughs> that's right. But um, we'll start with the idea of, of, of uh, narrative. And I was thinking, well, what do you get in um, ordinary <clears throat> sort of begun structured speech? And I was thinking very much of uh, how with my children, I saw this, they started to write and they write in a sort of way which like with the use of the word and, you know, I went to the shops and I bought a comic and I went outside and I saw this dog and it started raining and it says and 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 and. But it's in that world, which is very interesting phenomenologically. That is, you see, you talk about one damn thing after another. It's like this association, <laughs> this associative writing. See, the point about this is like, where does it come to an end? You know, and there's a need that arises because you can see you start somewhere and you go and say something more, say something more, say something more, say something more. But anyway, you're always going further away from where you started. And, 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 so. What does one do? You see, this is a practical question. There's no shape to it. And you mentioned in your description of the Enneagram one of the basic shapes, which is the, sometimes shown by the picture of the snake swallowing its own tail. Or a porous. Ouroboros, Mr. Ouroboros himself, you see. And uh, so that instead of the, I'll just uh, draw it for you, the sequence, just the sequence. That's because we're going to have pictures with this presentation. <laughs> yeah, well, they're not going to be very elegant pictures, I'm sorry, but never mind. Because my English teacher used to say to me, that the best writers were those that didn't use and. And she used to teach, oh, and absolutely. she was one of the best things for me for my own writing. I'm really I'm so grateful I'm I was told that. You got it, you know, mm. just you know, in this thing with the sort of series of arrows, you know, it's dumb and, and, you know, and you're actually saying that each arrow is saying something, you know, saying. and so it goes off. And it's, uh, and I've just said that. <laughs> <laughs> you see, there, and you've got to see, there is a question here of shape, 
and design. Something comes into it to make this more whole and complete. And the simplest thing you do, of course, is to turn it into a circle. And, you know, it's obviously this, 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 this kind of thing. Now, Very good, yeah. You see, look, this has a number of good points about them. The first one is that because you got it in a circle like this, you have an end in the beginning, which is the first, how to say, piece of structure you get because you've got a definite chunk in that thing. But more than that, they join the end and the beginning join at the same point. Now, you think back to the Enneagram. This is, in fact, exactly what you get in the Enneagram. Do you remember why? Um, well, because what? of the way the arrows go. No, you know, about the nature of the point at the top, you see, this has these two values, is zero and nine. It's the beginning and the end. And people are say, why do they want to put it in just one? Why do they say <coughs> we have it? They, they're the same point. The beginning, naught, the end, nine, they're the same point. Why is it like that? You see, but you've got it already. This thing is going to show you on the Enneagram. Think back if you're feeling a bit puzzled. Let's take Saka from the poet like the divine Mr. Eliot. In the end is my beginning. There it is. Well, that wonderful book by that scholar, Mercier Eliad. Do you know Mercier Eliad? Oh, I love Mercier Eliad. Eliad yeah. I'm currently Mercier... reading his letters and his diaries, so. <laughs> oh, that I've never done. But one of his books was The Myth of Eternal Return. Yes. Mm -hmm. And think about that and all the ramifications that hardly begin to go into about recurrence, recurrence, which is this same cycle. You know, which is this round and round we go. And you can, it's not simply to say you just, uh, it's repetition, but of course repetition is important because that's how you get understanding, because you can go through the same thing again and again. It also is, of course, a basic a symbol of wholeness, the circle, the whole. And this matters. Now, I have to dodge sideways again to say, just remember that when, um, people were dealing with the structure and so on. They weren't drawing diagrams or circles or anything like this. They were dealing with words and expressions, but they, one imagines they had quite vivid um, visualization and picturing of what was actually happening. So on the page, so to speak, you wouldn't get a circle, you'd get text, but you would read it as if it were in a circle. You would know how to do this. Now, this is very good also for, well, Two things. First, one is that whole idea of containment in the circle. You've got a container, and this is incredible. It's a hermetic circle, really, and it's so important. It's um, it doesn't leak, so to speak. It it, it can, can contain something, can can concentrate something, it can build up something, can have an insight in all these kind of words. See, I'm waving my hands around here in this kind of thing. <clears throat> but you're making oh. a circle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that is right. So, so far, all we've got in terms of our model, our picture, is a simple. I just get to write it without the arrows, so I'm out of circle. And let's put a top point up there. That up there is the beginning and the end brought together. Yep. So where and the I'm snake not... would be eating its towel. Exactly. My imaginer was response to this by saying it is a bit like a ring. Yes. And it's a lovely it's diamond it. on the top of it. <laughs> exactly. This is the jewel, you see. Mm -hmm. is very... Now, this was in this thing called ring composition. This was given the social name by the scholars, that is. And they called it the latch. So it's the idea of the finger going around in like that. And okay. they bound it, so I need to bind it together. And 
in the writing of these things, people would have something there which would consolidate them, which actually would identify the bringing together of the beginning and the end. Now this, I'm thinking of the word degenerated or faded out in time. I and mean, what you got left in it was, of course, the idea of the moral of the story. You know, you get a story told, and then at the end, you get the moral of the story, which brings it all together. So that's the idea of the latch. It brings it all together. And as I said, you go back to the Enneagram, and it had the same thing. The naught and the nine, the top point is the union of beginning and end. And it's that which makes it whole. Okay. And it's very important. It's a very artistic point. Now, we haven't um, yet brought in this part of this word, chiasmus, or chiasmus. I think it's chiasmus pronounced. The key is that cross figure from the Greek. Excuse me. And that is, what is this meaning? This is sort of crossover. Well, we're going to go back to this. Uh, circular figure, and I've put some arrows back to show you. <coughs> you have the two sides there, you see, have two directions, coming out, and it's going out and then returning. See what I mean? Yes. Oh, this always puts a, a thrill, little thrill to me. It's sort of going out, going out. Then so what does it do? It has to turn around to go back and go back. So there is a certain place on it, and I'll do a black circle on here. I should write the words in here. Latch and the turn. So when you come to the turn, it sort of turns around, literally. And so, so it means the order here is repeated here, but the other way. I'm oh, sorry, I got it upside down. Right. Right. Yes, I, I get what you mean. So it's, it's like yeah. it is going back on itself, but it's it's sort of renewed itself in some way. Mm, I mean, maybe not renewed. You see, but this is already this is simple form already evokes enormous associations. You see, it's like a <clears throat> there's that picking one example from my association to another thing all that comes from a source returns to that source. The source. yes yeah. <laughs> there is involution and evolution evolution so we've got involution and evolution involution is normally the right hand well, it depends on whether you're looking at the enneagram isn't it the the, the one to four side and evolution's the five to eight side Mm. Or have I got that round the wrong way? Well, it doesn't matter too much at the moment. Just if you, because here actually probably simpler to stick to this simple mm -hmm. uh, picture here. And think of it in these, this general pattern of ex what's expressed in these you know, creation epics and so on. Um, but in this very extraordinary way, that is to say, you have, say, in Christendom and that kind of theology, this going out, which is like the creative, because of the creation, it goes out. And like in the Gurdjieff picture, you sort of see, it almost sort of gets further and further away from the source. You see, mm -hmm. so think of it. then it turns around and begins to regather itself and reconcentrate itself. So it's like sins out, then reconcentrates again. It disperses itself and then gathers it back together again. Um, there was, um, I don't know, I get it, the, the words right, but this great theologian of the sixth century, Scotus Aragena, who had this incredible picture of the creation and the counter-creation, has to be creation, but a counter-creation, because creation this takes you away from the source and needs this counter creation to return. That's why Gurdjieff always said, this work is against God. It's going in the other direction, it's going back. 
but, but then we want to return to God once we've been on our journey round. No, you see, you know, you've got to get this. You know, get Heraclitus the way up and the way down is one and the same, but you see, the evolution takes you down. Now, bring in the picture of my favorite ones of this swarming of salmon. And they swim upstream to get to the point where they can begin again. You mm -hmm. see? Uh, so they breed up there and they come down the river and go and spawn and grow and develop and they come back so they can begin again. You see, but this definite reality, you go against the, the stream. This is only to say that you're going counterwise. Think of Gurdjieff doing otherwise. You have to go against the stream. Now, that's the sort of cosmological association you can get from it. Now, so how did this turn out in uh, some of the stories? Well, I'll have to take the um, Masnawi. I can only do this in outline because it's a complex book, you know, and you have to know the story. I don't know if you know, until you read it about the way in which in the first book you get a series of stories. And about the handmaiden or the lion, I forget the details of them. And um, what's interesting is that you get six stories or six events. Then these six stories are expressed again, but in reverse order. So imagine you have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever, and it goes G in the opposite direction. Now, let's look at why they do that. Why, and you have a question about why repeat the same, it's not actually the same story, it's the same words, it's the same content, so to speak, it's about um, a doctor or a lion or whatever it is, but it has a different interpretation. So you get, that's going to put in the latch here and the turn there and the dotted line between them. And then you get uh, on the other side, one, two, three, Oh, damn, I can't get right now. One, two, three, four. Damn, I haven't got the right number. Anyway, I have to get right. I can't rub out black pain. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go back there, I'll redraw it. I want to get you a simple picture of it. The six and six is quite a common thing because I think it is related to astrology. Uh, so one, two, no. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So I'll put it A, B, and I'll show it to you in a moment. E, <laughs> F, there's F again. E, D, C, B, a, but I'll put a dash on in reverse. And so it may look a bit messy and difficult to follow. But you see, you've got the ABC of the stories going up one, and they're repeated going backwards. Now, why yep, do I get that? It. Sorry. Okay. Yep, that's but yeah, I'm having revelations as you're talking about it actually. About right, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. It, no, uh, it's making sense of other things that I've done in the past that maybe I, I didn't uh, understand at the well, time. Very good. Yeah, because there are these, you know, it's based on, uh, Mary Douglas writes about it's based, maybe based on basic things of our nervous system where our brains are organized, because there's obviously a, a sense of symmetry here. But bring in whatever associations you like. I mean, one I always bring in myself is to say, like, this middle line is like the, <coughs> the looking glass in Alice. <laughs> so you look through the glass and you see it. The other way round. The other way round, yes. Other I'm actually using round. an Alice in Wonderland cup today, so that's good. There you are. That's, <laughs> very that's exactly you see. Um, right, yes. But, but then he, Lewis Carroll, he knew secrets, <laughs> stories, sacred ways, the mysteries. Oh, you see where you get this, what you see. The number, what I want to see is, of course, you've got the circle. Which I say is like the container. Now you've got this these, these sides to it. So there's something's going to happen 
between them and is usually put as lines across. That is to say, because they're about the same thing. And this is a simple form of it, it was more complex, you know. Just put so, so they're opposites on the picture. A yeah. wouldn't be opposite A, would it? It would be. Yes, it is. Oh, it's, yes, a, a and A dash, the two forms. Oh, okay. You got it, you see? So that's what yeah, because I, I thought it was back one. A, A, no, it's got to be the same form in this simple form. And so you got, <clears throat> what you're doing there, <coughs> you're having two sides of the same thing, two versions of the same thing, two perspectives of the same thing. But by saying that, you imagine that the people who do creating these things were, were artists, you're, you know, just doing it in the, the way they did it, in the way they felt. And to make, to make use of these comparisons, and I will in a moment talk about the way Rumi used this, which was a very strong uh, application, very interesting application. But I remind you about, you've got these lines, which has a meaning, and also the central line here, which is a sort of basic bare symbol for what's, if you like, it's rather like being the spine of this organism. It's the central column, you see, which holds it together. And some um, poets, and I might show you, if I can find it in the book here from which Simon got out from Sufi love poetry in India in the 16th century, that actually build along this line a whole theory which could be read in its own right. And I will try to explain that in a moment, as you can anticipate this already, this simple device, was really like dividing in two, uh, can produce a lot of interconnectivity and so on. Uh, but why <clears throat> have this kind of repetition? Well, it helps memory. Mm -hmm. because by repetition and so on. Uh, but it also brings in psychologically this extraordinarily important thing, which is just simply having two versions of the same thing to contemplate, which already stretches your mind, you know. It's like two sides of, you know, you, you start thinking a line, but you bring it out and you're sort of stretching the mind in between. You know? Get these two different versions, you see. Uh, so know. could one side, this is, I'm just speculating here, one side be the left brain story yes. and the other side the right brain story? Yes, yes. That's certainly one modern interpretation of it. You know, this kind of thing. Absolutely. And uh, it must, as, as Mary does, it must correspond to something natural in our, where our nervous system is built. You know, because it, it, it's, it has to be capable of being recognized and renewed by people. Excuse me. No, I'll give straight away the, uh, the way Rumi uses it in his Masnawi. And he's given a possible interpretation of the left and right sides. But he does it in a very, very strong way, which Simon brings out in his book, The Mystical Design of Rumi. And that is to say this right-hand path will be, tells these stories from the perspective of man. But the left-hand side tells the same stories from the perspective of God. <laughs> so already, you see, what a teaching. If you, if you absorb the whole text and you understand the structure and you've got this a very active contemplation going on in you, these two sides of man and God. And of course, you, I suspect what corresponds to the middle line then? What, what person? Is Go on. The seeker. See, yeah, I was going to say me, but I didn't know if that was me being. Yeah, the seeker, yeah. It's yeah, me. <laughs> 
this is like you know this has got you know put it through it into the exoteric the esoteric you know and then this is the well, then you call the psychokinetic or the interpretation but these are so fluid you know like you don't have to make it into a form you can make it as elaborate or as simple as you like and uh, there's definitely an art it's not a, just a mechanical device or anything and the, the great master homer you know, for example does it in such a way that it's uh, outstanding he Now, when I've drawn these uh, parallelisms, I want to remind you of something in the Enneagram. And just uh, leave you to picture it for a moment in your side. You think of it with the numbers round, you know, not at the top, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You see this kind of thing. So at the top, you have the same one, you've got nine and not. Now, the next line down, you've got eight and one, which also makes nine. Then you've got seven and two, which makes nine, and all the way down. And I think this is, you see, this is like saying that the, um, of course, the wholeness of the whole event is in that top point, which we call the latch, you see. But then it, it's elaborated in these different, so to speak, sections of the whole as you go right down to the bottom. <coughs> and each is offering a certain perspective of this whole. So the top point is the main Oh, because it's the end and the beginning, but it has all these intermediary approximations to the whole. But just think how subtle this can make your writing. Absolutely beautiful. And so when you get in the, I say, when you get to the Enneagram, you do have that, uh, you have a remnant, I believe, of that string composition in it. And I'll try and do the thing as prettily as I can isn't very much. And I'll say something about what the key difference is between the two systems. And then say, remember what I said, the, the, uh, the ring composition goes back at least to the time of um, Homer. And there's a suggestion it's even older. It goes back to the Rig Vedas <clears throat> of India. Um, So I'm going to sort of... And also that. probably why verse is such an important thing in it all, I suppose. What is? Verse. Oh, verse. Well... For doing this kind of thing. Because I can't help associating you know, the meaning of the term verse is actually turn. Hmm. That's right, yeah. Converse is to turn with and so on. And it's yes. uh, <laughs> very important. So now, as you know, you, you get the sort of things. So I try to put the two together in some way. So just down a little bit, just a little bit down. That's it. That's, Super. That's great. Because I, I can't see my it. Ah, here we are. <laughs> you see the bottom line of the triangle, which is the three and the six. See, those are the um, two inputs. You like it because it's so many shocks or other doughs or whatever it is, and it's represented as that. You see very differently how oh, he actually Goethe says at one point about you get this unity here, and it's divided into these two down here. So it has these two perspectives. That's where it's together in one whole, and that's where it's split into two sides. You see, and you often find it's very. I find it very useful to do the enneagram to think about you know what's it's three and what it's six um, and i'll add one thing here i don't know if it's helpful or maybe not you don't know the exercise but there there is a basic exercise mr bennett developed called a de decision exercise in which very clearly this point three is called choice it's where you've got to go through and make your mind up about doing something and the other side six is actually decision and so they have the same apparent character, choice and decision, but they are radically different in quality, you see. And knowing this too gives you the whole sense of this exercise. And it's absolutely important. 
Also, it's very important to get the qualitative sense of these terms, not treat it mechanically. Yeah. Mm. Just putting them together. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, brought in the Enneagram. Well, I want you to just look at this line, my favorite line, the down in the middle, on which we had you know, on this dividing. And it goes through at the bottom here between these two points. Point four, point five. Now, I have to refer you to Mr. Bennett. Uh, I remember being quite surprised when I noticed this. It took me some time being dumb to notice it. That um, in, say, his, I call it his favorite little classical enneagram, the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whoever looked at it, you know, kind of, you know, which, you know, you get all this, you know, get. get getting your plan together and the menu and assembling the ingredients, <clears throat> doing the, the cooking and so on. And it's, he actually puts in a point there between them at the bottom. Oh, does he? Yes, you look it up what he says about the kitchen. Maybe. And he goes, hey, Mr. Bennett, you are cheating. <laughs> or doing something naughty. No, yes. <laughs> But what does he call it? You see, it's very interesting, Debbie, because I think you see, you see, he said, he's made a big point of it. He said, once you cross this line here, can you, oh, oh, up a bit, that's it. You cross yep. this line here, you got, you've done something irreversible. You put this thing in the oven, and so it's changing its, the food's changing its nature because of fire. Sacred fire. fire. <laughs> And you see the, how it makes it strong, you know, this, 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 that's the step of irreversibility. This is the dramatic moment. That's the turn, you see. You know? But I saw, ah, then it's what this in, he doesn't ever justify it. But what it is, you see, is the remnant of the ring composition there behind it. You see. The remnant now, of the ring composition behind yeah. it. Yeah, but it's, it's like um, the ghost of times past that's still got that form behind it. Ah, yes, I get it, I get it. Yeah, huh? oh, great, I'm glad you do it. <laughs> it's playing it badly. It is so no, no, you didn't, it's just me not quite getting it. And it would help other people as well, yes. obviously, that probably. Absolutely. Um, we, are, we need time to um, <clears throat> digest it. Now, going to something really esoteric and it can sketch because there's so much which I've hardly assimilated myself. You see, you get many, okay, got association. This is so, it's a, one of these kinds of forms, which is so, I don't know what the words right are, deep and subtle at the same time. It can be, has many different kinds of meaning. And one of its meanings has to do with music. Uh, which often comes into these all ancient systems have something about music, just as Gurdjieff did. So I'll just say as an aside, I won't explain too much, you do get annoyed by the way in which he does it. But there is a, always a musical thing because the circle can also be used as a, a symbol of the octave, the do to do, you remember the enneagram, mm -hmm. initial do and comes down the second do. And in that, I don't know if you've heard the phrase, the sound, in the sounding of the first do is the sounding of the second do. As I begin, so shall I end. All this kind of thing psychologically is so neat. No. <laughs> so, I did know that I, saying, but I never thought of it the way you just said it. Oh. Yeah, that's... Yeah. It's a... Because it's something you know, psychologically feel, you know, you've got an enterprise and you, you start, you get it, it's right, you feel bang, you've got, there it is. So it's at that stage, it's only, the whole thing is only um, sort of like the twinkle in the father's eyes, it's a potential, so to speak, and it has to be elaborated and brought in, into being. And one of the things there is that it, uh, when I speak about the octave, has this, brings in one of these uh, special terms of Mr. Gurdjieff, which you may have heard of, 
and I'll say the word and then we'll go into it. And that word is the Harnal Out. You know that word? I do know that word, yes. Yeah. But I couldn't explain it. I get Harnald, Harnald Mout and Madalnin, or however you say it, very mixed up. So what was the next one? Madalnin, or is that Emdalin? I'm not sure what that word is you're trying to say. Oh, okay, well, forget that one, but I do know the other word, but I'm not very good at explaining them. You see, the word Harnal actually means middle. Out is an Armenian word for eight. Eight oh. is the number of the octave. That's why its, it's name is octave, is eight, eight notes. Do to do, you see. So that's the middle of the eight. Now, it's very complicated. He talks about it in terms of the Enneagram. It's absolutely, I find very awkward, not really believing. But here it's perfectly true, because if you take this as the, you say the, the octave, do to do going round, you see, then this is the middle point of the octave. Now, this in music is called technical word is the tritone and in middle ages it was known as the uh, diabolus interval the interval of the devil devil yes the devil's yeah okay I've mm -hmm. it, um, the exact term i've forgotten the latin for it and it was banned from medieval music you see now of course, in recent music, like Debussy uses the tritone because he has a special scale and so on. It's not that trouble. But what it, it's very valuable for a lot of kind of feeling re reasons. And one is that it emphasizes that this point at the bottom in the middle, I know which Bennett gave in his example, named fire to. You see, fire. It says what? Fire. Fire, yes as in the kitchen, you know, that's the fire comes mm -hmm. in, the heat comes in. That is, it doesn't give you a sense of um, um, drama, of uh, chaos coming in. And this is changing the whole story, so to speak, this is something like, this is something remarkable happening there. Now, it so happens in terms of the formalisms, different cultures evolved during that of India, the character and the mythology of India, which is placed at the bottom point, is called the god Agni, who is the god of fire. <laughs> and so you get the sense, god of fire, a tritone, the middle of the, of the octave, and it's, where is that? There's the point, you see, this is far away from the end as it is from the beginning. That's the point of maximum displacement uh, and that's the whole nature of the term now can we extend that and uh well, I've seen I have to say this is quite synchronous for me because last week I was talking to someone about the devil's note and how in music surely there should be an angelic note to counteract it no, or no, a no, divine no. note to counteract it okay. <laughs> I find it very interesting this for me, it's been real revelatory because of it being the halfway point where we, you could go. You can continue on, can't you? Or you can yeah, give up. Right. <laughs> no, you could get completely oh. sort of deranged there. Yes. Now, mm. I've given various kind of uh, interpretations to this and they're mine and so on, but I think they're for me extremely exciting and so on because one of the implications or which is thrown up on me about this going back to it as something to give it the grand name cosmological that you have this sort of creation you see now what comes then and this i won't be able to justify in any detail just at this bottom point is something like the incarnation you see, it's something put in, in the creation as found at the lowest point, which has an independent freedom. So it's also the place 
of the rebel is is Beelzebub criticizing the authorities is all of that is also as that duality you find in the Christ symbol of you see he's the son of the father but he's crucified you see and this I and this is the nature of um, symbolism in his major work about the nomadic universe, when it goes into this nature of symbolism, he says very, very important things about it. Because <clears throat> he's not, so for him, symbolism wasn't, you know, you've got the symbol here, and here's the, what the meaning of it, the symbol, here's the meaning, you see. It can't be like that. He said the essential thing about symbolism is that there are multiple meanings all at once. It doesn't mean one thing, you can't make an equation, this means that. If you start talking like that, you don't get it at all, you don't get symbolic language. And he actually talked about, you know, it's very rare to find a group who can deal in symbolic language because you've got to have this sense of the manifold meaning all at the same time. Yeah. And it is, if you get mechanical minds who don't like this, because it's going to mean A or B or C, you can't sort of mean A and B at the same time, but there it is. So there, I think about something introduced, I was just, I get off on it. I, I project onto this picture, so it gets introduced into the creation, which is at the, um, what do you call it? It's like in the shop floor, yeah. in the dirty world. <laughs> and there's even, I think, a way in which I could paste onto this that story I love very much. I'm sure you know it, <clears throat> the hymn of the pearl. You know that story. Mm -hmm. Yes. You see what happens to the, you know, the sun, basically, it's so interesting the way. It's a crude part of it. it is, the prince is taken from he heaven and put down to the land of Egypt, you see, which is here. Lift and the book up just a little bit. Okay. That's it. Sorry. Great. My finger is getting cramped. And then oh. a, that where the dotted line is, you see, going from above. I don't know if you remember the, the story of him. Because you see, by the time the Prince himself has got there, he's forgotten who he is. And what happens is that the Father, Divine Father, Mother, send the bird to him, who tells him who he is. And that's just at this point. And that's where the turn comes, because that's he can return. You know, so I've emphasized this part because I want to, I would say this story Telling is a big clue to all of this, you know, and these ancient hymns and, and, and so on, you see. Oh. And it is important because I think a lot of people, they kind of know there's something, but they don't know what it is, but you're explaining to them how this works. How it works. And because I took up the theme myself in my book about it and so on. Oh, storytelling and movie making and all the rest of it. And, uh, and uh, I found it was that subject matter was very suited to the Enneagram now, talking about this. Mm -hmm. Now, let's think about then a moment of pause. You see, I suggested that this thing is called ring composition or Semitic rhetoric. And scholars seem to have really established that it was practice over many cultures, over many thousands of years, and they're not just imposing their preconceptions on the material, it really is something very genuine, because you get this change of understanding, and you, you, you see it in this way, suddenly you go, ah, oh, I see how it really does fit together. And it's also, and she insists very much, it doesn't, wouldn't just have my accident, it's, has to be intentional. It's very, very sophisticated. And we have in this to remember the kind of cultures of that time, which we, they didn't have much textbooks. You see, they didn't have that kind of thing. You know, so because it, well, you don't get textbooks until you, until you get printing and that kind of thing. And, uh, but because people are used to picking up things by example, so you don't need to have it explained. And so you, get them acquiring a picture, not from a 
abstract model, but from various examples they've come across, which is then they understand how to do it exactly. Well, the, I suppose something like the apprentice way rather than the academic way of doing things. They didn't have academia. But um, what is the, you see, I suddenly thought, not suddenly, a long time, I thought, look, what's going on here? I say, I feel, I believe, I imagine that there's this kind of ring composition thing, which is uh, the precedent, the prototype, or the beginnings, or the suggestion of something like the Enneagram. Well, what's, what happened in going from one to the other, even though I can't begin to answer why it had to change from one to the other. And I want you to notice this one thing, and just in your imagination now, just look at what I said about the ring composition picture, we've got the circle and so on, and we've got the latch and the turn, and that's basically it. What sort of picture that is, there goes the enneagram with the circle, but instead of that one vertical line bisecting it, what do you have in the enneagram? Can you say? Well, we have, sorry. Can you say? Well, we have well, the the symbol instead, don't we? The. Now, what specifically do you have instead of the vertical line in the ring composition? I don't know. You don't. We don't have the anything. Triangle. The what? Oh, the triangle. The triangle. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Yes. The triangle. Threefold, <laughs> the law of three. <laughs> <laughs> Ring composition is twofold, which is the bisection. You see? The enneagram, typically Gurdjieff, always threes, threefold. Oh, I looked at that and I thought, mm hmm. This was, if you kept on, you know, from <clears throat> the ring composition and we had in this threefold, then everything changes the way the lines cross and so on, all of that changes. But uh, one interesting thing comes, and this is a little bit uh, mathematical and complex, and so I, I won't show you the um, actual numbers too much. You just get a picture of it. You see, why? See, you ask, as you know, as you, I think you read out it and you, you ended up reading out this thing from Gertrude about the law of three and the law of seven, how they're combined in the Enneagram, in the Enneagram that's right. Mm -hmm. um, it's so fundamental. And my first response to that was, oh, so like the Enneagram emphasizes um, stereoscopic vision, has two perspectives, the three and the seven, at one eye and out the other eye at the same time. But what? else it does is quite remarkable. And I just mentioned it, it may be a, a bit too confusing. That is to say, why the seven has to come together with the three, because, and this is sort of strange, because three plus seven equals 10. And the Enneagram works on the decimal system. It relies on the decimal system. Now, people will say, well, there's only the decimal system. That's the system, but it's not. There are all kinds of systems, no. yeah. number based. Now in the, very interesting in the, uh, we go back to our ring composition, where we have uh, the two, you see, you think, can, does it have something corresponding? Enneagram three and seven. The ring compositions, two. And what was the other one? It's three. The ring composition is actually based on the law of two and the law of three. Enneagram is based on the law of three and the law of seven. But in the ring composition, it's not decimal. It's based on what's called an, the base of five. I may be getting too complicated now, but there is a kind of logic which shows that it's got to combine two with three. I, I know about the base of five, but not very well. But I know that some ancient civilizations, they worked on the 10 system, didn't they? 
which yeah, would be that's, well, that's the decimal system. That tenth system is decimal system. Yeah, but there, there are other systems like the in Sumeria, the due, the due decimal system based on twelve, which we inherited until the twentieth century, and so on. And you can base it on anything three, five, seven. It doesn't matter what it is, but um, usually this is excluded because we've got habits of which one we do. Get it that. You see, I wanted to get there is a hidden logic here that people don't see. So they accept. Goethe says it's the law of three and the law of seven. Right, fast, gut, right, three and seven, right, right. Let's go on with it, yeah. <laughs> da, 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 da. But, and I say, why? Why fundamentally? But he very carefully does point out that the, the number of systems in the Enneagram only work because of the decimal system. And it's not absolutely universal, the decimal system. It's only one kind of system. And the way it works out, in fact, he, he actually says explicitly it can't, um, it couldn't have been worked out before, you know, getting on to the 15th century in Europe. They wouldn't have been able to do the kind of calculations needed in developing the patterns and so on. This it has to be fairly recent and so on. So, but just raise, I just want to raise the prospect, it's just a distant thing even, that there is a fundamental reason why there's a law of three and a law of seven. But it means if there is that, then there are other candidates. The Enneagram has relatives. <laughs> It has okay. Four, this has four bears is also and it has descendants and its descendants get interesting. I remember there is a, you see, and I'll just uh, jump the gun on this because and get into some largesse of wise acreing, so to speak, you know, the next one up was well, actually try stuff and then I'll start going up from the Enneagram. You see, is there one above the Enneagram? Yes, there is. And it's contains, it has, I can remember if I got it right, maybe I think I got it right. It has the, um, based on the law of four, and the law of 17 is the next one up. Four and, the, and 17. Yes, and it, what you have on it, it's, it has um, 16 points on it. The Enneagram has three. Sorry, the Enneagram has nine. Nine, yeah. Logical ring composition, which is uh, so has four. And you see the only thing, there is a pattern goes from squares. There's actually yes. one center of the ring composition, which is one squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, four squared is sixteen, and these all have corresponding forms. So the Enneagram is this one particular example of a whole system, which is probably chosen pragmatically because it's relatively simple and based on calculations people are used to and so they can make sense of it but there is a pattern and I think the most important accessible one is this of the ring composition and so I they're not the same thing no or, they're, right yeah they're I call they're it compatible yeah the relatives, you know, I like this thing, the whole idea of modern thinking, Wittgenstein used it, family resemblance, so to speak. But they're built on the same principle, but you've got to get at the principle. You see, I think there is, um, and I wanted to do this myself because of my background, like Pauline Bennett in a way, not to have things so arbitrary, they're just these guys come up with this diagram and say, this is a wonderful show, it is. You see, but I wonder, well, what, what did you, why, how did you put it together? You know? Uh, we have to verify. So yeah, you've got yeah. the the physical back, the physics background to be able to try and work this out. <laughs> Without, yes. What are they constructing? What they're trying to do? And it's it's absolutely remarkable, and the, the, the increasing complexity from the two to the three, and what happens from it, and so on. It's a very good one. Uh, but I think it's possibly better because there is now a whole corpus of um, work available, you know, about the use of what this thing I call ring composition. So you can begin to look it up and it may be surprised to learn, you know, I didn't mention it, that you know, people have taken it very seriously, for example, in regard to the Quran. And there's one interesting thing, I can't give you the name of it, one of the surahs, uh, which has been looked at in this way. Uh, of course, it's always a little bit dodgy, you do anything with the Quran and the Muslims get very upset. 
because you don't like it being analysed. Um, yeah, we don't want to cheer hard on, put on you, Tony. <laughs> no, we don't. but you get this analysis about uh, the, uh, about the religion. There's often there's a lot of um, rhetoric in, in the Quran against the unbelievers and so on. So this is it's absolutely amazing how right at the center of this soil in the beginning, there's one phrase or one kind of statement which actually embraces all religions. It's the only statement like it in the whole surah, but there it is right in the middle. Uh, in the middle of the Quran? In the middle of a surah. Oh, verse. surah, right, yes, okay. Now, then uh, so it's done. Uh, I'd look at, I think, the Gospel of Mark. And you look in the center, and there's a reference to a phrase I'm going to use, not quite right, something like the golden boy or something like this, a reference to a certain character who only appears just there in the center of the Gospel of Mark. And this is, see, pointing something out. And this pointing something out, I myself subjectively associated with. Um, you're just things about lawful inexactitude and so on, but I think here is a way where you, you, you do get an intentional pointing or highlighting something in which the key message of the communication is located. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Um, so we go, I'm just looking for an incredible treatment about the whole of the um, Old Testament, because this can be on any any uh, scale, you know, a little story and very big stories and even whole books. I can imagine the whole of the um, Old Testament put into one ring composition. I'll find it in a moment. <laughs> It's one of those things you know, you ever want to find something. You yeah, the dark do. forces stop it appearing. <laughs> there are the dark forces. The latch. Oh, we come on. Oh, no, no. It's the law of Monsieur Sod. Monsieur Sod and all who tells it. But you see, but you, you've got to get, of course, this idea of scale. And so you can have big and small, and you can have rings within rings and so on. You can imagine me, me absolutely, um, how to say it, um, extremely complex. But the point is to help memory and, and understanding. It's beautifully designed for that, so somebody can put something there which can enable something to happen in the understanding of the reader. I think that's so important. It is, yes, a continuous movement. Yeah. It's going to be that thing, the central phrase, come on. It's just, <laughs> da, da, da. While you're looking through, can you just spell that word for me again that was key? Chemus. Chemus. C H I A M U S. A M U S. Yes. Because right. that is very important as well for people to look oh. up more on. Oh, here we are at the beginning. You only get again, so I'll try and point out. This is the. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 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 it's more than 12 in total. But um, this, uh, this shows it in a different way as a kind of step pyramid. You just get the idea of the general shape of it. Could you just do it a little bit closer to the camera? That's it. That's great. So down the bottom of the very books of the Old Testament or the Pentateuch, and above it is the analysis of them. And so you see the pairs across, the pairs across. You should just like, a, imagine it's over a circle. It's just put in this way, 
as a way of representing it in, in a way to understand what's happening, how it's built up. And it, what it brings up is that right in the center, where my finger is pointing here, and oh, I have to yep. go. Up a bit, that's it. Is I think Mount Sinai. <sighs> yes, Mount Sinai comes near the, near the, uh, it's not quite this, this uh, third one down. It's, it's and, and so what's that book again? Because I know people are going to say, what was the book? Well, it's, it's the, the, the Hebrew Old Testament. No, that book that you're getting that picture from. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Thinking in circles. Ah, okay. So people, because I know people will ask otherwise. Uh, Mary Douglas. Mary, is, Mary is Douglas, just, yeah. It's very nice because she's um, well, she's a lovely woman. I, I was a good she died before I could meet her. It's only about 140 pages, it's not longer. And she goes through all sorts of examples, he even ends up looking at Agatha Christie. <laughs> and it, and, uh, and so that you see this. I'll just read out some of the, the correlations across here because I can't show you both at the same time. It's like right near the top. This actually the central point is, is theophany, you know, which is a kind of like the revelation of God, the appearance of God. And it detailed in my presence, which is right in the middle to the actual presence of God. Then the covenant between God and man, which is this next layer. And beneath that is the thing about Mount Sinai and about the sanctuary. And I mean, so you get um, these various ep episodes in the story of the Jewish people, uh, including the Exodus, entering into the Promised Land and so on, and how this form, the simple form of the cosmos, yeah. the two sides, helps form the whole journey in one's mind and hold it together. See? But also, you get the inner and outer meanings. And inner and outer meaning, mm. absolutely. I uh, love it. I'm going to get that book. I think you like it, uh, Debbie. Mm. You know, it's more than you know, because she, she, she's a very honest kind of academic. She doesn't try to just bamboozle with a lot of words and so on. She's actually looked into it. Uh, um, almost a down-to-earth sort of way and try to make it accessible to people. And she tackled a very severe problem. I don't know if you've ever heard of the classic English novel, Tristram Shandy. Yeah, I've never read it. I know of never. it, but I've never read it. Yeah, I hardly remember. I saw the uh, <clears throat> film they made of it, which is something like this. I had a little bit of impression, but she tackled it because, everybody, you know, people regard it as, as mad. You know, rambling all over the place. It's just like, hey, well, what's going on? And then she shows how it has elements of ring composition in it, which, uh, if you know about, can help make it intelligible. Because why? Why? Because because you're getting away from this thing. This and this. This says this happens. That happens. The other thing happens. The other thing happens. The other thing happens. Da, 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 da. Of course, that one thing after another thing is the picture of the mechanical life. Um, and you know that, or I would know, or I would suggest that when you look at this, you say, well, this is going to make sense, you know, in a way we've got to bring in things like the future acting upon the past to the ending, sort of coming together with the beginning, you see, it's got to be something drawing it together. Uh, and this is what it is, this is the composition, what draws it together. Uh, if you're any little episode, it may seem you do. My God, this yeah, now this is happening and that's happening and that's that but no you see this it's a teaching about the, there is a pattern a meaning to things even though it might involve very dark events and so on there's still a pattern a meaning and it can embrace not only narratives or stories but where you have to do complex teachings and there are parts in the Bible, like to do, I think it's numbers I mentioned again, which you get episodes of, and also then bits of the uh, traumatic law, the Hebraic law and so on. And you, you begin to sort out which is which and you see it's a way in which they can 
have a sandwich of elements of action, elements of uh, what do you call it, jurisprudence of, of the making of laws uh, coming together. And it, but it all makes sense in this people dealing with complexity and uh, so on. Now, anything else come to your mind? You could have at least one more point to bring into the picture. No, because that's a lot to ponder. It's like my brain's whirling at it all because <laughs> I, I know everything you're saying is really ringing true for me, but at the same time, I'm having to ponder yeah. a lot of it because it's a lot of new information so a, for me. <laughs> so it's the thing to do in the end, you know, Debbie, is, is when you can get around to it, it's, you know, it's just like do something yourself, make something. <laughs> I, both I and my old friend colleague Richard Heath, we both at one time studied this very extensively and used it in our own writings. Uh, and uh, you can bring to bear on it like small samples, there was like this saying from Churchill, he was claimed never to start a sentence before he knew how to end it. Mm -hmm. See, that's the latch. Yes. And I remember... To be honest, I'm like that about my books. I don't know how these authors write books that start, I'm just starting it and seeing where it goes, just baffles me. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> I need beginning, yeah. middle and end. <laughs> there you go. Of course, the beginning, middle and end is more the Enneagram with the, you know, the classic three scenes, which is Aristotle, uh, beginning, middle and end. And then, of course, in some forms of the symphony, you have three movements as the classical one and so on. Why do you have that? And uh, then as you started me thinking about something else here, <clears throat> which, of course, tends to happen. You get to maybe you, you, you look at you look at something else. I can't remember at one point, but I'll take that. You see, the, in terms of the Enneagram, there is um, in, at least uh, two ways of dealing with it, because you, one's used to it in Enneagram, uh, thinking, you know, the circle, the movement. I, I would say more or less, right? but there's mm -hmm. another way, which you take the two directions, a bit like they're in composition, and, and it becomes quite fascinating, because you, you get that theme of involution and evolution from Gurdjieff, and um, Bennett took it up as saying, <clears throat> you can define life as where involution and, ev and evolution are balanced, you see. So then becomes this middle part of the Enneagram at the bottom, so to be, is then a priori this realm of life. Okay. Mm -hmm. You didn't look at it as going on to something else, but it's actually, there are regions then, this region of the, what's below life, life, and what's beyond life, and how they come together into this dynamism and and uh, oh yes I can't help I, I can't resist uh, speaking about movies now and just briefly mm -hmm. but I undertook such films as the Terminator you know the old Schwarzenegger film and I saw something very interesting about this thing called the hexatic cycle you see I mean might end up with uh, speculations about that. <clears throat> you have, <clears throat> as I said, <clears throat> excuse me, but this is talking about that. Getting back to Enneagram, <clears throat> this picture, you know, the kind of, it's a history, it's a story, da 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 da, da the end, <clears throat> in that sort of way. But there is the, this other way of uh, looking at events which is, has a different character. And this, what we're from beginning to end is the way we call it in time, in linear time. But this, the inner cycle is different. So when I dealt with the movie Terminator, I had, of course, to deal with its content and certain matter, which is time travel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I saw, of course, the inner lines were actually the story from the point of view of those characters in that film who travel through time. Whereas Sarah Connor, who appears in the movie, she's subject to ordinary linear time. She doesn't know anything else. So these other characters impinge on her that they're coming from another, another realm, which is in touch with the future as much as with the past. See, and that kind of thing. And I just thought there it was. 
in the movie, of course, some people, as my dear friends, have frowned upon me for using such a low film <laughs> to describe these spiritual things. I thought it was, it was absolutely very good perfect. films. They're very, you know, and obviously the storyline about all also robotics and AI and things are very apt for today. And time travel is very apt for today. But yeah. that's very because it is. It's her, her son's in the future, and he's sending back his father, though he doesn't know yes. it, back yeah. to the past. And then the exactly. Terminator himself is coming from the future into the past. But then there's many different Terminators, so they could be different points again. And then our first original Terminator, though he's bad at the beginning, yeah. <laughs> turns and becomes the good one that looks after the little boy. <laughs> yes, you've got it. I you can you see, appreciate if you take, uh, I, like, I get really reactive to us people taking the Enneagram in terms of talking about spiritual matters or something like this. I think it's not a very good, not much help for getting understanding. Because the understanding really comes out of one's actually ordinary experience, you know, how you deal with your ordinary experience and these kind of things. So I thought mm, movies, I wonder if you've got these guys make these movies, they're creative people. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing so, and they're creative doesn't mean they do it random, actually almost the opposite. They're finding connect, connections and forms which make it coherent and meaningful. They don't just do stupid things at random. Well, some do, right? because they're perverts, but no mind about that. Well, so that's why see. certain films still stay true for it. Well, like kind of like myths, that underlying story that they've done because oh. they've thought about it. And like you say, what you're saying about them. So it's a story that's quite pertinent rather than the crappy films, which is just someone's like, well, I'm going to try it from this way. <laughs> but they've not following what would be a, not a pattern, but like like the Enneagram octaves, not mm -hmm. following the octaves. Oh, so I want to emphasize, you see, I want to, to, to say to people, please don't get, and I have particularly for saying this, stuck on this damned good European octave. It is a kind of um, extremely artificial device he uses. But it's, he, it's the, there, there are patterns, you see, you want to be, it's going to be sensitive to the patterns. And uh, then, because you mentioned myth again, and I picked up on that in my mind because uh, the classical thing of, um, Campbell, you know, the hero with a thousand faces and so on. You look at it in what he calls <clears throat> the monomyth, the basic myth, uh, it easily maps on to the Enneagram. It's a, or some math through the Enneagram. And uh, I think this is this is this is most exciting and even uh, you can Because in a way, it's a dramatic story too. I mean, some of the Castaneda stuff usually gets onto the Enneagram. You just look mm -hmm. at the this side of all of this, <coughs> excuse me, which is to do with the uh, <coughs> the past of the hero. And I always say to people, I don't. You just have a few more minutes. I hope. I hope I'm not taking you from your. Well, that's walk. fine. A few more minutes. I'm concerned that you've. I'm not got a drink there with you to. Yes, you... I didn't uh, prepare myself. Wet your lips. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you normally have your cup of tea, so that's why I thought, right, I'm going to make myself a hot chocolate so that we. <laughs> but. I thought, I, you know, oh, I, yes. <laughs> oh. And I just wanted to quick. Yeah, I suppose I use the word octave because I've heard many people describe the enneagram, not the enneagram, the symbol, but you know the numbers round it as an octave. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I should yeah. use the word the that's enneagram what, numbers. Yeah, that's what that's what Gurdjieff did, you see, and I think it's uh, it's very misleading. Just incidentally, I mean, just for somebody in the audience who may respond to this, because the uh, octave comes out in his what he calls the Law of Seven and. I was just the other day because I was researching that I looked up something and he, there he says about this law of seven. And he's very insistent. He said he took the law of seven to be the law of hazard. And he always kept on insisting. If you try to, he always said, if you try to pin it down, you end up with nonsense. He says, you mustn't pin it down. And you see, this is difficult for a lot of people to understand. If you're not pinning it down, you're not getting it right. Well, this is the kind of mentality. Things got to be pinned down and have to be right and exact to be true, but no. And so he said, actually, the, you got to get the basic idea from that. It was the law of everything is uncertain. See, 
but it uh, for some reason uh, the the like Gurdjieff insisted on what well, in a way it's true to the general character of tradition to be of using music as as a language as a metaphor for everything but I still can't understand why he used just one form of the octave because there are six basic modes and the octave as he deals with it has five notes and two half notes in half it notes, yeah. and the nature of the octave depends on where you put the half notes so the one he uses has this do re mi fa you know that is so la si do right there's two octaves there that's the only one form of the octave why does he stick to that one form of it it's, it's, it's insane but and nobody questions this why he did that in that way it's only it's in major it's key uh, key of c major it's the dorian scale i think in in in, in the platonic uh, series but why uh because there are and just think of um all the other kinds of octaves in the world like an indian octave has got 22 notes in it and this kind of thing uh, octave, the word octave is deceptive because it means eight, of course, but actually what matters is the interval between do and do, which is twice. The higher do is twice the frequency of the lower do. That's what it is. It's two, number two. And then you see a whole other world. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. I try well, to say about. We spoke about this before in a private conversation. I kept meaning to say this to you afterwards because I had to think about it. And I was wondering. Maybe Gurdjieff did that on purpose because it would make uh, people go on and look at it rather than just feed us the information. He's just given us a little tip bit and people like yourself have figured it out that there's more. Yeah, but, uh, I'd, um, oh, there are a lot of questions around it, including I just <laughs> have mentioned something right about this whole thing about <clears throat> the group secrets of the truth. I'm very really sure, you know, what the stuff Gurdjieff had, he couldn't just done it all himself must have been some group or other but you never get any evidence about them who they were what they did how they worked and it's so frustrating he keeps on talking about ancient manuscripts he never shows you a single document in all of these propositions <laughs> you have to believe what he says and all the rest of it but anyway i just wanted to deal with this, this picture of the um the underworld in a way and uh Look at this picture you see here. I simplified it a lot. You get the circle and just a horizontal line at the bottom. Now it's the whole thing is what it's like. We've got the near where I live here, the uh, site of the Thomas the Rhymer. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Yep. But he, he was a mystical prophet in Scotland <coughs> who got uh, taken by the fairies one point the queen of fairy fancied him and he was stuck with her for a time and he got out and he was cursed by her actually he always to tell the truth so he became a prophet and that kind of thing but anyway there's all this thing of going sense about descent into the underworld and there is in the path of the hero in the campbell thing and the way in which he has to go into this world this other world which is a place of trial, mm. effort and trial. Yeah. The shadow. In, in Lord <laughs> of the Rings and so on. And even literally, because there's a lot of it in the episode, we have, they have to go underground into the place of the dwarfs and the mines and so on. So the, um, and so you get this whole sense of the, uh, well, you can hear the portals, you have to, there's entrance in and the entrance out and so on. And possibly at a certain time, not careful, you never come out. Yeah. But it's the underground because it is, I think, in going back to a Gurdjieffian language, it's in a way the place of work because there's a place of effort and suffering. You know, and you think about the parallels with Mr. Bennett's favorite thing, the kitchen, that's the realm of food being made. In Goethe, it's the deeds and sufferings of light. This is where the first cycle you see up here is simply this established the separation at the top is home. And to separate from the home and the person on the vision quest leaves his people and goes into silence 
and often fasts and has no food until he has to meet somebody who is the guide. And so the shop becomes the guide who has taken him through this portal. And it is... Um, Which is sometimes your other self, your dark self. Mm. If, if, yeah. if we did it through the Star Wars analogy, Luke Skywalker met himself. <laughs> yes, you could have all kinds of, of, of twists on it, but uh, yes, the, um, yes, so maybe try and uh, wrap this up because there are lots of implications in this. But what I like to leave people with is if you get into it and, and um, find these patterns, one of the uh, indications that maybe you're onto something is you find so many things become illuminated. Uh, and start to make sense in a new way. Um, so don't um, get too stuck on the visible forms of these things. Enter in, if you can, into, into the spirit of them. But there, this one, uh, I'm going to claim this is more or less a, the kind of summing up line. <clears throat> in both the the ring composition and the enneagram you get this uh, emphasis on the middle because um, it's uh, that's where the action is that's where the interest lies uh, it's uh, where life is uh, and this is a very simplistic qualitative idea but it's extremely helpful and uh, the ways of going through it, and the Enneagram that has a very sophisticated thing, there are three ways represented by the three symbols. One is the circle, which is the, <clears throat> we call it the daily round. <coughs> you have to go through this, the long way around, so to speak. Then you get the sense of the hexatic cycle, which is the smart way around. And if you've got this, special perception and insight, you can go that way. That's where the sequences are quite different and quite otherwise. But the most profound of all, of, all, of course, is, is the triangle, which is the law, the true law, that I used to call the logos of the thing, which has to do with the purpose when you get directly connected with the purpose of the whole thing. And this is the most direct of all. You don't need to go through either of those other two if there's a depth. But this is just an exposition coming from just taking these elements and you contemplate them and you begin to draw out of it the meaning and try to test it with your experience. But that theme, which you know, definitely has that definite expression in ring composition, the meaning is in the middle. It's a wonderful guide. So Mary Douglas, wonderful when thinking in circles. Um, and if there's uh, anybody, I don't know, I just don't know whether uh, David would have promised to make posture diagrams or just leave people to remember what you can remember. But do remember, try to do it in your own way first, try to make, make one yourself, actually make one. It's like, for myself, I'm the sort of person, I, I, I as a teenager, got interested in modern art. I just I only could only read it in books I got out of the library. There's hardly any around I could actually see. But I had, I was forced inwardly out there to actually do some myself. That was the only way. You can only understand by doing it. Yes. And That's even true. with music, I, I still to this day cannot play a tune, but I've spent hundreds of hours on pianos and even I had an organ one time making sounds, getting into communication with sounds. You can always do something. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do it. Do it. Do it, yeah. So, I've had found through my life, it took me a while to figure out there are dreamers and there are doers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You're a doer, Tony. You're a doer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got and also do you also got to do things your way. As long as you have been conscious, it's your way, and it's not the right way or anything, it's just the way by nature you have to do it. And you have to take it into account. You have to make it in your own spirit, your own body, your own type, your own what do they call it? Oh yes. 
when it's telling me never let you know whatever it is the war is cramp your style you that's see. it blaze your own path blaze your own path but don't <laughs> do it in ignorance you know and i'll know other people's paths you just say okay i'm stuck being me so there we are yes because i know from my own experience in my life when i was younger and learning things i thought i had to copy other people but i've realized no you learn from other people but then you do your own thing you do it that's your it. way that's and i know that's hard because we all want to feel we're doing the right things so we think we must follow and copy yeah. somebody yeah. else absolutely it was i'm more and more you know if you're copying somebody else you've really got it wrong <laughs> it doesn't mean you, you, you ignore everybody else you know it, it, you said it already i no need for me to make it more confusing. Well, thank you, Debbie. I hope that people are interested and can get some sense from it. But, and also the spirit, you know, of, of um, you know, it's investigation, it's inquiry, it's just not, um, not expecting one to be, what is it, um, given baby food about it or pre-digested, <laughs> something pre-digested, but you've got to work things out for yourself. But it's um, always, you've got to make it, always, not just meaningful, but enjoyable. Yes. Well, Gurdjieff himself said, have fun. Did he? Oh, that's good. Yes. Thing. And I'm actually working on a show all about that at the moment, actually. So that will be coming a up soon. <laughs> oh, a show. A musical. <laughs> no, just like another talk from me on, on, the cha on this channel but about, about having fun and how if you don't have fun, it can kill you. <laughs> Yes, it can. You know, mm. it's, it's having fun is a very good medicine and protection and, and all the rest of it. And it makes for friendship, which is... Yes. Very <laughs> and it's fun. always fun talking to you, Tony. I've really, I always appreciate all your shows. And every time I learn something from it, and every time I think every show gets better and better. And I just sure. wanted to tell everyone that your website is diversity.org, where we can find out more about your work, find your books, learn about mm. your diversity yes it's not up to date unfortunately and uh, with all of it takes so much time doesn't it you know what it's like you must with the amount of work you do on your magazine and so on yes yeah yeah my, my, my magazine's home is risen if anyone's interested in looking that up we have some wonderful writers there on an esoteric magazine for today no so exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and even, even Tony's contributed, and hopefully he'll contribute some more sometime. But we, I find talking to you on these kind of shows are revelatory, and I know people like them and enjoy them. So I thank you very much, Tony. And I just thank wanted you. to say, I have a little pen pal. Um, his name's Wayne, and he always sends me, well, we write to each other, pen pals. But he always sends me a bit of a verse. And this week's was a roomy one. So if you don't mind, I'm going to finish the show with a roomy, very short That's verse sent beautiful. from Wayne. And Rumi wrote, make peace with the universe, take joy in it, it will turn to gold. Resurrection will be now, every moment a new beauty. So thank you very much, Tony. Thank and you. thank you all for listening. <laughs> and all you folks out there, join in the conversation. That's it, right. yes. Well, people do comment, so this is great. You'll be, you'll be intrigued by all the comments our lovely listeners put down. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to press stop.